Welcome back. Well, this is going to be our last Monday video for a while. I am scaling back to three videos a week. So we will have a Monday video today. We will have Friday, Saturday, and Sunday videos this week. Well, Sunday will be next week. We are still doing book club on Thursday nights. And of course, you're all welcome to join us there. And starting the following week, we will be doing Wednesday, Saturday, and Sunday. All right, so let's get into what we are looking at today. Today, I decided I was going to take you to two of Paul's little cubbies at Bedford Antiques. First of all, I want you to see what these cubbies look like so that when I say Paul's cubbies, you know what I'm talking about. And frankly, sometimes I will just go in to one cubby and it will be uh, like a thrift haul. And that is pretty much what happened on this shopping trip. So we'll get started when we come back. So, the first thing I want to show you is the actual cubby. It's an old china cabinet, and I think I found three or four really good items just in this one cubby alone. Uh, then I turned around, there was another cubby, a similar sort of china cabinet, and found some more. So, today, Paul's cubbies. So, let's start with the first piece I found. We have one of Paul's cubbies here. So let's go in and take a look at the salt and pepper shakers that are coming home with me. Uh, Native American design, made in Japan. Nice condition, $5. Oh yeah. So I love salt and pepper shakers. You know that uh, when they're interesting and unusual, they sell really well. I think salt and pepper shakers are a great way to throw personality into your home, especially since most of us have varied taste. You know, we might say, oh, I love Victorian furniture, but you go into our homes and there are little odd bits of not Victorian because nobody is just so in love with one style that they don't have any room for anything else. And salt and pepper shakers are a great way to throw something different into your style. Personally, I love Art Deco, but I do not decorate with Art Deco. Um, you can see that in the East Lake bookcase behind me. The chair over here is mid-century. Um, yeah, the, oh, the lamp is actually Art Deco, so got me there. But I don't want to live in an Art Deco museum. On the other hand, I have a couple of salt and pepper shakers that I've tucked away. They're in a drawer, and I should be ashamed of myself for that. But they are both Art Deco because I, I love deco and if I can keep a couple of little deco pieces small enough to fit in the palm of my hand, well, I'm going to do it. It's, if it fits in the palm of your hand, it's not really hoarding. So that's one of the reasons I always go for salt and pepper shakers when I find them. And these interesting Native American pieces sell well. I think a lot of the reason is when you look at, um, at pieces like this, they were made in Japan. They're depicting Native Americans who are a people that the Japanese have no connection with and certainly only 
encountered watching American Western movies. It's just, there's something really charming about that. Um, I would have to say that, you know, the images are stereotypical. In general, I, I, I don't know. Uh, they're borderline offensive. Not always, though. I've actually seen some really interesting pieces that were not at all that what I would call offensive. But still, great pieces. People love them. And I think a big part of that, uh, that love is based on the fact that these are the people indigenous to our part of the world being depicted by a people from another part of the world I think it's just something we get a kick out of. So, uh, that was not the only Native American piece I found in that very same cubby. So take a look at this. Okay, same cubby. This is a Carnival Glass Indian head toothpick holder. Um, the iridescence on this piece is really nice. And we should probably talk a little bit about carnival glass because I know a lot of you are interested in it and would like to know what is or is not collectible. So we'll take the opportunity to discuss it. Yes, carnival glass. And I know a lot of you like carnival glass, a lot of you collect it, and we've never really done much about carnival glass. So I thought we'd take this opportunity to just sort of give it an overview. Uh, carnival glass is American-made glass. If it's carnival glass, it almost certainly came from the U.S. I am not discounting the possibility that other people might have made carnival glass in the past or might be making it now because there has been a resurgence in popularity. But what we think of as carnival glass, the antique carnival glass, is turn of the century U.S. made. Um, it was made by companies like Fostoria or um, Fenton. Fenton was the first of the American carnival glass manufacturers. And of course, you know, we're all familiar with Fostoria Fenton, especially if we are into glass. Carnival glass has a metallic glaze over it. That shimmery iridescent look is not integral, integral to the glass itself. I always have trouble with that word. Uh, and I am having a little more trouble with my words since the Bell's palsy. Difficult words are not tripping off my tongue as they used to. Gotta work on that. It's a glaze over the glass and it's a metallic glaze. And that's why very often carnival glass will have that sort of oil slick iridescence. So carnival glass in general, if it's in good condition, if it's an interesting piece, uh, if it's in a good color, in general, these pieces go for really good prices. Um, they say the average price of carnival glass, even without getting into the highly collectible colors and designs, is 30 to $50. So if this is something you're interested in, I would say do a little research because carnival glass is out there, readily available. It's hard to go into a thrift store without finding a piece of carnival glass and check it out. Uh, so when, oh, and let me go back and, and just tell you, it's called carnival glass because it was given away at carnivals. Now, you, that would lead you to believe that this is how all of the carnival glass came into the population. Now, very little of it was actually given away at carnivals, but some of it was. Most of it was simply purchased. 
Carnival glass was intended to be a low-cost alternative to the fancy glassware at the turn of the century, like Tiffany and Steuben. And those things were out of the price range of the average consumer. But when Fenton started making carnival glass, they wanted to create the same look, only do it very economically. So they did. But they found that there was no market for this mid-range pricing. And that's how they, they started to sell it. At a mid-range level, they thought that the wealthy would buy Tiffany, the mid-range buyers, um, the middle classes, would buy their carnival glass. That's not what they were calling it. It became called carnival glass much later. But they would buy Fenton art glass. And then they were ignoring the lowest level of the market. Turns out the glass did not sell. Apparently people either wanted the fancy Tiffany and Steuben or they weren't interested. So they had to reduce their prices and reduce their prices and reduce their prices. And eventually it hit the point where it was giveaways at carnivals. Um, it showed up in the five and dime stores. But they stopped making it in the 30s. Uh, basically, depression glass took over in uh, the 1930s. So most carnival glass that you will find, with some exceptions, is antique. It's over 100 years old. The exceptions. Um, Benton did begin making carnival glass again in modern times, you know, um, 1990s, I think, they went back into the carnival glass production on a limited basis because it was so desirable and collectible. So what do you want to look for? Well, um, you want a well-made piece. You want a good coating of this uh, um, iridescent glaze. In general, this is just in general, and keep in mind, I'm giving you like a whole um, genre of glass collecting in a few minutes. So this is going to be extremely general. In general, the darker the color, the more valuable the glass. Very general. The reason that it's just a generality is there is a very pretty color of, of sort of light green that is extremely desirable. Those pieces go for a lot. But in general, it's the dark purplish colors that are almost black, the deep, deep reds, the dark oranges, and there are a few lighter colors. There are some light yellows that are popular with collectors and they go for big money. That green, it's called ice green. Really nice pieces of carnival glass sell in the thousands. So, in general, if you see it, don't ignore it because you, you, if you can pick it up cheap at a thrift store, at an antique store, grab it, take it home, take a chance on it. In general, it's going to go for a decent amount of money, small pieces even, fetching $20, $30. The larger bowls, the vases, you know, we're talking 50, 60. Um, and then like the big sets, the console sets or the, um, uh, the sets of, of iced tea, they would do pitchers and glasses and sets like that, thousands. So if you see it, pick it up. All right. Now, as I say, that was just a down and dirty overview because I don't want to devote the entire, um, video to carnival glass but just to give you an idea of the collectability, and it is something you should grab if you see, what to look for. And remember, as always, condition, like anything else, is important. That because that's a glaze, it can be scratched off. Because it's glassware, it can be chipped, it can be cracked. You, know, you want to look for good condition. All right, so let's get back to Paul's cubby. Um, 
same little china cabinet. Okay, here we go. Okay, same cubby as those Native American pieces. Very pretty, flow blue plate, English, one dollar. Oh, and if I forgot to mention, the carnival glass Indian head was five. That was a great little plate. I like plates like that because with flow blue, in general, the plate is more blue than white. When I find one that's more white than blue, uh, that means I can mix it, uh, for example, with a plate that's more blue than white and create a really interesting tidbit tray. And as I've mentioned before, I get a lot of requests for blue. Don't know what that's about, but I guess people who like tidbit trays also like blue. So that's going into my tidbit tray stash. Um, really pretty plate. That was a dollar. Um, and, uh, uh, that, that was a no brainer. That was a really sweet little plate. And even if I didn't have other plans for it, that is the sort of thing you pick up a flow blue plate for a dollar. You know that the legitimate retail price on this is probably going to be seven to 10. All right. Next up. Same cubby. Take a look. Well, this cubby turns out to be an absolute gold mine. Let's take a look at this. Now, let me take these out. These are individual ashtrays. They were very popular for things like bridge parties. And we have an elephant and it's very hard to read because that's embossed and there's a lot of glazing on it. Made in occupied Japan. $10. You don't need to ask me twice. Thank you very much. Well, as I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, I think Paul fell into a collection of occupied Japan. I started seeing a lot of occupied Japan pieces in his booth. Of course, from what I understand, he has warehouses full of stuff. So who knows where these things came from? For all I know, he could have been collecting this stuff since the beginning of the Occupied Japan period back in the 1940s. I don't know. He could have bought this stuff new. But I'm seeing these things coming into uh, his booths and cubbies and they are nice. That ashtray set at $10. Now, this particular shopping trip, this was my $10 or less shopping trip. $10 was a great price for that. That is a wonderful set. Four little ashtrays, perfect condition, the little elephant holder. Um, nice. I like the fact that it's brown because that's an easy color for people to throw into their decorating scheme. Whatever color you're working with, brown is a neutral. Um, nice little set. So I was really glad to get my hands on that. And when I turned around, right behind me, another china cabinet. And that was Paul's. And more occupied Japan. So let's take a look. Okay, different cubby, still Paul. Therefore, we know we're going to find something really interesting. So let's take a look at this. We have two little musical angels. Very tiny, occupied Japan, 250 each. Oh, what an easy call. So, two little angels for two fifty dollars apiece. Those are going to be tidbit tray toppers. No two ways around it. Um, the images are just really interesting. They're little musical baby angels. And all I need to do is just connect them 
to the right set of plates. So again, I was extremely happy to find those. The prices, $250, and they're in perfect condition. Yes, they are very small, but that's, that's exactly what I need for my purposes. At the time that Occupied Japan pieces were hitting the market, and remember, the period for Occupied Japan is 1945 to 1952, period, seven years. One of the things that makes Occupied Japan so collectible is because it is perfectly situated in the mid-century, and there's no mistake about it. You don't find an Occupied Japan piece and say, well, this is from the 1930s. No, they were only available during that very limited window following the Second World War. So that's a big thing for collectors, being able to accurately date their pieces. And it's very unusual to have any piece that you can date to such a tiny window as seven years. But at the time these things hit the market, little tiny collectibles and figurines were all the rage. People put them on window sills, they put them on their bookcases, they put them over the tops of the molding on their doors and windows. It was just what they did. Um, you were nobody if your house didn't have a thousand little tiny things that had to be dusted. Now keep in mind, this is, you know, well, I, I was going to say pre-television, but it, actually it wasn't. It was just pre-TV in every home era. This was a time when, when someone walked into your home, you needed to sort of do something to stimulate them mentally. And I guess people thought loads and loads of little trinkets would do it. Um, however, I, I do have to say that, that, you know, people still today go into somebody's house and look at their little trinkets. It's very interesting. But these tiny little figurines, that was the rage. Then later, and by later I'm talking 80s and 90s, we began to think a little differently. We began to think that less was more. So instead of a thousand little things, we have one big thing, obelisks. Remember that? That, that was uh, a thing. You know, people just had this big thing that looked like the Washington Monument and it was on their coffee table. And if you had an elegant home, you had this giant marble thing that, giant marble obelisk sitting on your coffee table, and that's how everybody knew you were elegant. Oh, taste change all the time. But um, I, I was glad to get the Occupied Japan pieces because I do like interesting toppers for my tidbit trays. And then, same cubby as the little angels, but I think I had to open the bottom door for it, is a piece that you've seen in another video. So here I am, you know, having bought the piece. This is the, the trip at which I purchased this piece. So let's take a look. Okay, we are still wandering through Paul's cubbies. And we found a tomato teapot, $10, very nice, Japan. Now the thing about these that you want to look for is this handle. Because the handles were made of rattan, nine times out of ten, when you see these old pieces, the handles are missing. And I'm going to make a point of finding some other pieces for you to show you missing handles. That's what you see more often than not. Ten dollars, yes, worth it. Well, there was a lot of controversy in the comments about this teapot. Is it a tomato? Is it a pumpkin? One of our viewers, who was a botanist, weighed in on the issue. She said it was a tomato. I'm not a botanist. I'm deferring to her. Um, but other people were saying, no, it's a pumpkin. You know, we have been on lockdown way too long when we are willing to devote that much time to whether uh, a teapot, 
um, is in the shape of a tomato or a pumpkin. Regardless, it's a great piece. Uh, the, the thing that made that piece very desirable is that original handle. Uh, also, you know, it's a cute shape. It's a fun thing. It's, uh, that's something that is going to throw a splash of color in somebody's kitchen and they're going to be happy to have it. But officially, because the botanist has spoken, yes, it is a tomato. Um, which, by the way, neither tomatoes or pumpkins are indigenous to Japan. Those are both um, American vegetables. So, oh, tomatoes, fruit. American fruits and vegetables. So, why would we be surprised that the Japanese might have a little difficulty differentiating between a tomato and a pumpkin? I don't know about you, but I'll bet there are a lot of things indigenous to Japan that I wouldn't be able to identify. All right. So this brings us to the end. Um, I will see you all on Friday. Um, and as I say, that will be the last of our Friday videos. And meantime, let's take a look at JLS's beautiful horizon pictures and get ourselves a little bit of calm and serenity before we hit the rest of our day. All right. See you later.